welcoming everybody to this edition of Living in a Leitrim Landscape. Uh, this week's guest is uh, Dr. Larry Cassidy. Um, you might have been reading about Lara's exploits recently. You've been in the headlines, Lara. <laughs> <laughs> New York yeah. Times, Nature, cover of Nature. Um, all, all over the place. place. You're everywhere. <laughs> Uh, has it has it been a big change in your life, Laura? Has it been a big? Um, yeah, no. I mean, there's only so much uh, celebrating you can do in lockdown. <laughs> Me and my mum had a glass of champagne, right. but uh, yeah, um, no, it's good. I'm just so glad um, it got such good coverage. It provoked a lot of discussions, debates. Um, it's really nice. I feel like a lot of ancient DNA papers tend to be big continental-wide stories. Mm. It's nice to do a regional one, and it's nice that uh, Irish archaeology um, got uh, a bit of the spotlight uh, uh, in, a, in a big impact journal. That was that was great to see. Um, um, tell me a bit about yourself. Just you're you're a West of Ireland woman. Yeah, I'm from Balmaslow, County Galway. County Galway, yeah. Where I am now, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's where you are now. Brilliant, yeah, fantastic. And the moment lockdown hit, I was out of Dublin, like, yeah. <laughs> beforehand, actually. I came down in early March. I was like, there's no way I'm getting stuck in the flat in Dublin <laughs> for this. But, um, yeah, so it's nice, to, it's nice to be home. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And um, what I was going to say, so just to sort of get, get to grips with this topic a little bit, um, the, Ireland is a, is a world leader in the world in, in this area of ancient genetics and, and Trinity College in particular. Is, is that fair to say, do you think? Um, I would say, yeah, we're, we're punching in with the heavy hitters. Like, we're not a massive industrial scale lab, like some of the operations they have. Um, but um, I suppose how we, we differentiate maybe is... Um, we tend to probably focus more on regional sort of data sets, but we sequence them to quite deep coverages. And um, yeah, I suppose we've tried quite a few novel approaches uh, in terms of trying to establish patterns of relatedness and difference between ancient populations, especially closely related ancient populations. Um, but yeah, it's all sort of grown out of uh, Dan Bradley's lab um, yeah, I was going to mention Dan. I mean, Dan has been your supervisor and so on. Yes. So he, he, I think when they originally sort of pioneered the use of ancient DNA in population genetics, it was focused on cattle yes. and European aurochs and, um, yeah, looking at the origins of domestic cattle mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the same techniques can be applied to human bone and um, that was experimented on in the lab for quite a while and then they made a huge breakthrough with the petrous bone. Mm -hmm. Yes, so a basic and summarize that very simply. Uh, um, so the petrous bone is uh, the bone, your cranial bone surrounding your inner ear and uh, what makes it really special is it's so dense, it's like uh, if you get a good petrus, it's like marble. Um, and when you extract DNA from bone powder from from there, uh, you tend to get very good preservation rates. So mm -hmm. a high level of surviving what we call endogenous DNA. Um, and that was brilliant because that's actually when I arrived to start <laughs> in the lab after they had been toiling away for years with finger bones and stuff. I came in and I immediately uh, started to work with Petrus bones and that was that was brilliant because that was the main hurdle with ancient DNA for so long. It was actually trying to get um, useful DNA out of it, trying to get sample DNA from the bone. So you guys were getting a, a complete genomes or, or very high coverage genomes. And the difference between that and the shotgun coverage or the earlier is, is remarkable, isn't it? It's a, it's a world of difference. Yes. Yeah, so we would sequence in the whole genome. So we tried to sequence DNA uh, from all parts of the genome. And 
to deep coverages. And when you go to deep coverages, you can distinguish between the maternal and paternal contributions. Um, but ancient DNA does still have the problem of, of getting enough good sample DNA um, out of bone. So there are other methods. Um, one of the most popular is SNP capture, right. where you target specific sites in the genome that we know are highly variable among human populations. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of try to pull them out of, of the mess of microbial and human DNA in your sample. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's one way to get um, usable kind of data from, from maybe samples that don't have very good endogenous content. But we, uh, our approach is much more, we sequence everything that's in there and reconstruct whole genomes. Right, that's very thorough. And, and the, the, the first big breakthrough or the first big publication that I recall was the Balanahashi uh, one that you did. Yeah. Yeah, 2015. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was a big one because um, we got in there at the right time. So um, the Neolithic and steppe migrations had just been established for continental Europe, um, for Central Europe, Germany, Scandinavia and Spain, but nobody had really looked at the northwest oh. of the continent. So we obviously are as northwest as you can be without being in Iceland. So <laughs> um, that was great. And we got one uh, Neolithic genome from Balnahati and three early Bronze Age okay. men yeah. from Rathlin Island. And they demonstrated major uh, migration and population replacement um, that fitted with what we were seeing on the continent attached to this sort of Neolithic agricultural movement. And then at the end of the Neolithic, these step migrations in that in some regions is linked to metalworking. And so an effect what you seem to have demonstrated, I'm trying to sort of, uh, I'm conscious of time and everything, just to summarize in a way, you sort of demonstrated three movements, if you like, to Ireland in a big picture. First of all, Mesolithic people coming, mm -hmm. hunter-gatherers, farmers coming later on around 6,000 years ago, and then subsequently another wave of invasion. Is that broadly the did you say a wave of invasion? <laughs> well, yes, perhaps, or yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I would say when we when we sample genomes from all periods of our Irish prehistory and history, including mm. the modern population, we see three very distinct populations. Right. You said the first, the Mesolithic hunter gatherers, mm -hmm. the second, your Neolithic early farmers, and finally the copper early bronze age population onward and the modern irish are very similar to that early bronze age population and um, so the implication there is major migration at the transition points and we've been able to pinpoint that down uh with denser templar temporal sampling now um and in this in this current paper we sequence the earliest neolithic genomes from the island uh from pulna brown mm -hmm. so they actually predate the house horizon and they are majority this early farmer ancestry coming in okay. and displacing the Mesolithic um, ancestry we have on the island. And before we get into it, we'll talk about Neolithic in a second, just before we move on to it, there is a kind of Leitrim connection with the hunter-gatherers, isn't there? there uh, Shramor is a cave in Leitrim and that yielded... Yeah. Uh, it's an unknown cave in Leitrim, right? They haven't been able to find it since. If right, I... right. So it's uh, like a lot of caves in Leitrim are very, very difficult to find. Uh, but Mary, <laughs> there's, a, there's a local connection too in the respect to Ross Muldoon and Marion Dowd out of the Sligo ITs. They had an involvement, didn't they, Lara? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Marion is um, sort of uh, pioneering studies of caves in Ireland and looking at the assemblages from caves. Mm. Um, I the Shemore study, Thomas Cador, yeah. um, was on the isotopes of that individual too. Um, so that was very important. And then we had another hunter-gatherer from Killura Cave, yes. in, uh, which is excavated by Peter Woodman. And um, I think Marion helped put together That's later right. publications on that. Um, so they were great. To have one from Leitrim was good, to have two. Um, was really important analytically for us. It allowed us to 
directly compared to Irish hunter-gatherers to one another, mm-hmm. then to hunter-gatherers from Britain and the continent. I you saw the difference? Yeah, well, we could see that Irish hunter-gatherers were extremely similar to one another. Um, they uh, form sort of a distinct clade within uh, the greater sort of uh, uh, a picture of uh, genetic variation of uh, Northwestern hunter-gatherers. Right. right. Um, and Britain, British hunter-gatherers don't do this. So you can't really uh, differentiate British hunter-gatherers from those you see in Luxembourg and France. I see. And that was really interesting to us. Um, it suggests that this Irish population was quite isolated and that's why they look uh, this individual from Kalura and this other individual from Shamor 500, 600 years later looks so similar to one another. Um, uh, that that's a signal of highly drifted population um, that's been isolated. And, and these hunter-gatherers looked quite different to the modern-day Leitrim people. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, these hunter-gatherers contributed probably quite minorly to the Neolithic population. Um, we did get a snapshot of admixture in action, which was mm-hmm. really amazing to find. That was down in the burn mm-hmm. in Nabinia court tomb, uh, which is excavated by Carlton Jones. And we found an individual from there who had an Irish hunter-gatherer in his recent family tree. Wow. Uh, he was majority of this early farming kind of population, um, but um, we did have contribution from the Irish Mesolithic there. Um, so that suggests, you know, there were interactions and mixing between these two very different populations. Um, it's very hard to then extrapolate on, on what those interactions might have been like. Sure. Uh, you can't, you know, you could have a, if we take a very extreme scenario of completely peaceful integration and assimilation, the Irish hunter-gatherers still mightn't have just been completely overwhelmed by sheer population numbers Mm -hmm. Um, and their genetic contribution would have been very, very small to populations going forward, even if it was completely peaceful and they completely integrated in. And then you obviously have the other extreme, which would be uh, uh, violence or Mm -hmm. lack of integration. Or um, I think I've seen terrible headlines like an extermination or a wipeout, but we can't really weigh in on either side of that. Except there is an implication that that there's survival for a time, at least, of the Irish hunter-gatherer population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it looks like there was contribution. Um, There was there was admixture in, but we don't uh, we don't know what the dynamics of that were, like the social dynamics or cultural dynamics. That's Mm -hmm. not. And I think it's very interesting because you don't really see if much of any of Mesolithic material culture within later Neolithic sites. So far. Um, So, I mean, let's keep moving from the Mesolithic uh, on to to the Neolithic time. I mean, uh, obviously one of the projects that uh, I know you from meeting you first was to do with Carol Keel and and all the work there. Um, And you've got a remarkable number at this point now of uh, of Neolithic uh, genome sequenced. Yeah. (laughs) Carrickville was like one of our first sites actually that we sampled um, and that was done with um, Thomas Cador and the character Kiel team and also um, the Duckworth uh, yeah. collection in Cambridge. Um, and yeah, Carol Keel um, was one of, of many Neolithic sites we sampled. We sampled mostly megalithic tombs oh. um, from across the island. We tried to sample all the different tomb types that most of us learned in primary school, oh, yeah. uh, portal tombs, court tombs, uh, Carol Keel is a passage tomb cemetery. Oh. Um, we looked at Linkard's town Kists in the southeast and uh, we had a few cave samples as well. And um, what I suppose we really wanted to know there, right? I think we had about 40, 44 individuals from the Irish Neolithic. Um, 
at the end of the sampling. And we wanted to see if we could look at any patterns of regional difference or relatedness, like our all of our individuals from the southeast forming a genetic cluster, you know. And uh, what we saw was, um, first off, ab absolutely no differentiation between the British and Irish Neolithic. Uh -huh. we, couldn't, we couldn't differentiate. Um, Using quite a sensitive analysis, we, we still couldn't um, pull the two islands apart. But what we could do um, was we found that passage tomb samples, including a number of samples from Carrow Keel and then Newgrange and then this um, atypical uh, uh, megalith in Millen Bay. Yes. Um, they all formed a distinct genetic cluster um, that... that shows they're all more closely related basically to one another than they are for a bigger data set. Um, and that was fascinating. Uh, sorry, go on. No, no, but I mean, this is, um, we, we, we see in your illustrations there, this lovely magenta color that you've used for uh, the, the passage to gang. Yeah. Um, and not alone did you do DNA with these, you also did isotope studies. We've talked a little bit about this in earlier talks on this program, you know. So Thomas, was Thomas involved in that side of things? Um, so the isotopes, um, me and Thomas got some of them done with Oxford, and then we sent other ones to um, Queen's. And then a lot of the isotopes that are on that plot were previously published as well. Yeah. Uh, from sites like uh, now, um, I think we had Mound of the Hostages in there too, and yeah, different Irish and British Neolithic sites that had been sampled for isotopes. Um, we tried to date and is get isotopes for all of our samples, because I really think with ancient DNA, um, if you're going to do the DNA, you should be getting it dated and the isotopes done as well, because they're powerful, most powerful when they're done in combination. And so what you showed, in effect, with your paper, this recently published paper in Nature, was not just the passage tombs people or the, the samples from the passage tombs clustering together in the genetic sense, but clustering together isotopically as well. Yeah, so we had this uh, really strange trend where all of the passage tomb samples seem to have um, quite a high trophic level, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, were depleted um, for C13. So that would suggest that the high trophic level is coming from a, a marine diet. Um, it might be more uh, meat or animal products or a ter terrestrial diet, although I don't think we can rule out freshwater fish as well. But what we did see was that they basically had this higher trophic level than our other Neolithic samples uh, from from Britain and Ireland. Yes, oh, our, our other monument types. Yeah. So, so, so these people were, were, were eating better. That would be the implication. Like if you're eating more meat, more animal product, products, that does imply a more privileged diet. Um, I think what we'd like to know then, um, a lot of our later samples were passage tomb samples and a lot of, of the earlier ones were uh, other tomb types. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's it, yeah. yeah, we need an idea if there's a there's an actual overall change in, of diet in Ireland um, through the Neolithic. Mm -hmm. But then we have Caro Moore, which mm -hmm. is a very early passage tomb sample. Mm -hmm. and he has the same inflated uh, trophic level as well, despite being earlier in date. And, uh, so, yeah, and, it, it does seem. Like, yeah, and and so. So therefore, there's this, there's this, there's this diet side of things. There's this genetic uh, distance, but there's also uh, interconnectedness in a more, in a closer sense between some of the passage tomb samples as well. Yeah. So we see this sort of general passage tomb cluster um, where they all seem more related to one another than the general population. But then within that, what we found were direct kinship links where we could actually say, okay. These two individuals are about six degree relatives. Mm -hmm. So, so in layman's terms, that would be I think a six degree relative is about your second cousin once removed or your great time for grandparents. Grand. So these are distant kinship links, um, right. but they're there.
and they're detectable, kind of like 23andMe <laughs> uh, when they give you all of your distant sure. cousins. Um, so we found specifically um, our our key sample in that paper, the individual from Newgrange. Um, he was getting a lot of press, but what got lost was that he has a he has a six degree or so relative in Territ at Carrow Keel. Yes, uh, the, the, yeah. uh, that, that's the thing. And, and just to, to talk about those relationships a little more, um, the Newgrange guy, he's, he's got a six degree relative in Territ at Carrow Keel. Um, mm -hmm. And there are other interconnectedness as well. Yeah. Uh, then the uh, other kind of uh, focal sample we had um, that we're getting a lot of positive results for was uh, Caro Moore. Yeah. That is the earliest passage tomb sample we had in the data set. It's actually from another publication. Yes, uh, it's about 5,600 years old. Yeah. And um, Caro Moore showed that same sort of distant kinship with the. Uh, samples from Carol Keel, the Newgrange individual, and an individual, the individual from Millen Bay. Um, in, in, sorry, Lara, but, but in terms of time, we're looking at, so this, here's a map, let's just try and frame it for a, a general audience here. So what we have is we have somebody who's buried in this style, in the central monument, in the focal most sort of uh, highest point in Carol Moore, yeah. uh, about 5,600 years ago. Then we move on something like 350 years or something, uh, we're seeing Newgrange and Millen Bay. Millen Bay is in Northern Ireland, um, mm -hmm. uh, current for Loch there on the coast. Uh, and we have Newgrange, which we all know Newgrange. So here we have two individuals. And then 300 years later, or 350 years later, we have people at Carrakeel. And there's inter interconnectedness between all these people. Yeah. And Amazing because, um, I mean, these sites were already linked to their material culture, right? The megalithic artwork at Millen Bay, um, uh, at, in Caramore, at Caracil, Newgrange, like there, there was already a lot of uh, parallels between these sites um, to find distinct, uh, distant kinship links between them is pretty um, extraordinary, especially when you consider, like you say, the temporal distances between some of the samples. Um, you, you, you know, you kind of have to think, and when you say six degree relative, oh. um, uh, it, it becomes a probability thing when you kind of detect kinship that distance. Okay. It, it could be a 10th degree relative, but just by probability they've contributed more um, to this particular descendant and you can detect it. Um, and I think we have to bear in that in mind when we think of the generations that might have been separating these mm. samples. Or um, there's also the possibility that uh, they're there's uh, they're related to one another by multiple roots, right? Right. That okay. is your, your ancestor in two different ways, or your cousin in in different ways. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, it, it is it just if you consider like the, the the time the space and and the size of the population of Neolithic Ireland across those um centuries it's um yeah our our interpretation was obviously this is a an extended kin group or or group of people who are related to um have access to a uh, very prestigious burial in many different parts of the island yeah, it, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I must congratulate you, obviously, on this amazing. This uh, uh, the thing that's caught the the headlines. Of course, there's been two aspects to it, I suppose. One would have been the fact of the discovery in Pulnabron of a child that uh, showed signs of Down syndrome, mm. uh, and and that's apparently the earliest Down syndrome we know of. Yeah, that's the earliest diagnosed case. Um which is an amazing thing with ancient DNA, we can look at now, uh, um, we can look at um, genetic disorders um, within the prehistoric record that mightn't be so easily uh, diagnosed just looking at, at the osteology. Um, and that's really important. Um, it's uh, an, another way of looking at the past, looking at diversity of the population in the past, looking at the bioarchaeology of, of care, mm -hmm. 
Um, and that this this child was how old when he when it, it passed away? So uh, uh, he'd be an infant, right. um, so potentially uh, not actually. Um, you know, it could have been just only a few months old. Oh, I see. But we have a dietary signature that's associated with breastfeeding, right. which is a very high trophic level, um, because you're you're drinking your mother's milk, yes, so you're yes. up on the food. But, very good. Um, so that's but like I mean that's I, I really think that's just a taster of, mm -hmm. of what would be really? done. You can't read too much into it. Um, yeah. I'm really excited to see um what ancient DNA can can do with them with this in the future mm -hmm. um, and looking at the, the lives and experiences of people with disability in the past I think it's um yeah there are stories that need to be told there Good. and the other headline grabbing thing that was talked about was this uh, the ancestry of this uh, individual out of this male in Ugridge who as we remember he's connected to people in Kerkeel, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think Carol Moore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, and this man, he, his parents were close relatives. Yes, very as close as you could probably be. Uh, <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, we could whittle it down to uh, either parent and child or full siblings. And you argue for siblings. Yes. Oh, uh, technically there is the possibility that it could be double grandparent, right, grandchild. Right. So there, you're, there's still a brother, sister, uh, full brother, sister mating in the family tree. Right, and then exactly. you're sort of in back up. And we just decided anthropologically and biologically that was sort of, there was no precedent for that. So um, we, we didn't consider that. We, we narrowed it down to brother and, and sister or parent child. And the interpretation you make on this is that, uh, based on some of the things we've discussed before, these interconnections, the, the diet, and this as example of incest, that mm -hmm. this is a dynastic Yeah, lineage. I mean, you could make that argument uh, quite well using just the son of first-degree relatives within such a prestigious monumental context, because the anthropological precedent is so uh, strong there. Mm -hmm. um, first degree, socialist acceptance of first degree incest uh, mm -hmm. has been um, really dissected and studied by anthropologists because mm -hmm. it's so rare. It's a universal taboo that there's very strong evidence that there's a biological basis for this taboo. This isn't something that varies among different human cultures. So then, um, the big question for anthropologists back in the day was, okay, well, if this is a biological taboo, why are we getting these exceptions? Mm. And what they found is that there was a number of like uh, predictors of it that you saw in every situation. Um, societies are, these societies that you find this in, it's almost exclusively among the elite in this mm. society. And usually the higher up the elite you go, the sort of, uh, more privileges you get with incest, like the closer. <laughs> um, their the societies are stratified, they're hierarchical, um, they're typically uh, quite complex, um, but not too complex. It's mm. sort of like a, using the own old anthropological terms, sort of like complex chiefdoms, chiefdoms or very, yeah. but, or very early states, but you don't see it in really established states because at that stage there's other ways to separate yourself from the general population and establish uh, power um, like with the military or advanced bureaucracy but that's not what, what we have here this is this is a step below that I think um, so, so, but, so what we're looking at here is something like the, the Incas or something like ancient Hawaii or something perhaps to some degree reminiscent of some point in the in in, in Egypt in the in the pharaonic era. I'd say if you're going to pick one of that, they're your most famous examples. I'd say if you were going to pick the best comparison with the Irish Neolithic, maybe I'm wrong, but I'd say Hawaii, mm. uh, just in terms of social complexity. 
um, yeah, these societies as well. It, it's amazing the predictors, you know, like where you see this behavior, it's sedentary societies, but not typically urban, um, usually more dispersed settlements. Um, like a, they're nearly always agricultural. Mm, mm. <laughs> so Hawaii, they also um, uh, subsisted on fishing as well. The first degree incest is typically associated with some type of magic or divine attribute and and that seems to be a way that the elite are allowed to break the taboo and break the social convention we're so special we're so yeah otherworldly or divine yeah. that these human rules don't apply to us and it, it's kind of i've said before but it's a bit chicken and egg mm. By breaking the taboo they are making themselves seem more uh, yes. divine different Divine, different they're able to keep breaking more taboos <laughs> so it, it's a really it's a, it's not my field but it's a really interesting area of study um the first degree incest has already been used to study cultural evolution in uh societies where we have written records and mm. um, we're able to now apply it to a prehistoric uh society that's amazing and that's sort of where we were hoping to go with ancient dna eventually um to to try to look uh at um genetic patterns of, of relatedness inbreeding all this stuff and then compare it to to anthropological precedences that uh, precedents that we do have documented evidences for evidence for and then see if we can actually infer something about past societal structure from this and it looks really interesting to see, I mean, I looked myself a long time ago at Listahol saying, was it a place of kings because it had a very central point, it was a focal monument. When we think about the man in New Grand Cheese on the right-hand side of recess, the people mm -hmm. out of, out of Karakil came out of Cairn Kay, which is a very striking monument in the right-hand recess, I think, mostly. Uh, so this is a very clearly auspicious... Yeah. Uh, Placement and Karakil, uh, uh, Karamore had a sun alignment that we debated with the sun shining in at, at Sawan, as Tara had a, a sun alignment. Um, mm -hmm. New Grange has a sun alignment. There are a lot of, um, you know, there's the, the, the same, uh, even right through 700 years, the same kind of items and objects are found with the burials. And the artwork. Yeah. And the artwork. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, and, and I think, like, there's clear religious connotations there as well, which have always been interpreted with passage tombs. Um, the importance of the sun and the the celestial bodies. Uh, the artwork oh. is so abstract and... <laughs> yeah. um, what's the word? It's almost psychedelic. Um, yeah. <laughs> in some ways, I've talked about that, like... You, you can see that this these were clearly sacred spaces. Um, and I think that's why the first degree incest, again, it's interesting because when you, get, you look at the anthropology, it's a typically a political religious elite, an elite that um, draw their status from both religious and political authority. And so, the implication is that they're nationwide. They, 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 these sites straddle the whole country. If you look at the map of Ireland, we're looking at uh, Carroll Moor in the west, Carrowkeel on the way, Millen Bay northeast, and New Grange. It's a hugely dispersed. Yeah, I think that it's amazing. It's like 150 kilometres between right. uh, the Sligo cemeteries and, and Bruna Boina. About another 100, 150 to Whatever, Millen Bay. Yeah. So, yeah, really long distances. Uh, and is there any some indication, sorry, Larry, is, is there an indication of, you know, you said that the, the passage to people sit aside um, in a little clade, in a, in a little separate group. Is there, is there a request to be made for the origin of that group? Are, are, are there origins? Is there a prospect we'll ever know if they have connections abroad, if they originated in Spain or France or the UK or something? So the we can't. We don't differentiate the um, the Irish passage tomb samples from the broader British Irish population in terms of how they relate to continental samples. Mm -hmm. What we see with the entire Irish British Neolithic 
is um, s sort of a, a stronger affinity to the Mediterranean route of Neolithic expansion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think of the two arms of the Neolithic coming out from Anatolia and the Balkans into Europe. And you get one that goes across uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, kind of leapfrogging along. Um, and then that then goes up uh, through the French river valleys up yes. into Northwest Europe that way. And then you have another arm uh, from the Southeast that goes uh, northwards and, and through the Danube river valley um, and ends up in the northwest again. <laughs> yeah. uh, over, um, over from north central Europe. So they kind of meet together, these sure. two arms in the northwest and in, in France um, uh, and uh, Belgium and that northwest coast. And then what you see is uh, quite a rapid um, colonization of Britain and Ireland about 4000 BC. Yeah. Um, so what we see there is more generally contribution from that Mediterranean route, but actually saying the exact route <laughs> by which yeah. that actually arrived, we're not there yet. We're looking at great data coming from France now, which was a missing piece of the jigsaw for a long time. Right. And um, uh, I think, um, it's still quite difficult to, to say anything too strong there, except it seems that Northwest France in general has more contribution from the Mediterranean route of expansion as right. well. Right. Um, but, but some mixing with the, with the other, the okay. other arm. So, so it's, it's, it's not easy to identify the passage tomb people in particular as having a, a, a particular external affinity. Um, no, we couldn't say. We could, all we could say is is they're very similar to other uh, Neolithic populations, sort of from Western Europe, Atlantic Europe. Mm -hmm. We see uh, similar signals in Scandinavia, in Iberia. Now we're seeing the same from France as well, and it just all seems to be a bit more of this Mediterranean early arm of Neolithic expansion than uh, the uh, the one that followed the Danube river in but there is uh, it's mixing it's not fully either arm and i see you've managed to upset lots of um, uh, medieval scholars oh yeah <laughs> um yeah <laughs> um yeah yeah it was interesting i mean that's what you want right i mean it's always going to be i said this it's always going to be controversial when you suggest something like that level of oral continuity. So, so, so what the suggestion was that Dinjankus has a, an account of incest mm. associated with uh, some of the monuments in the in the in the in the in the Boyne Valley, i.e. Nelf. Uh, Douth. Or Douth, sorry, Douth, um, I should say, so yes. The, the story there was that with the with a good view um, myth surrounding Bruna Boynia, there's um, uh, the so manipulation of the sun and the solar cycle is a reoccurring theme or stopping the day or stopping time. And yes. um, so there was sort of previous speculation there of whether uh, there might have been some memory that, that feeded into um, the, the myths that uh, medieval scholars wrote down uh, about the solstice alignments or, or the actual original uh, uh, function and structure of these yes, monuments. Yes. Um, so that was, that was already there. Um, when we found first degree incest and realized that the neighboring uh, passage tomb right by Newgrange has, uh, <laughs> admits specifically has uh, brother, uh, sister, uh, Mating. Yes. <laughs> um, that 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 was. Um, yeah, we found that to be quite a big coincidence. And just and, hard to you couldn't ignore that coincidence. Obviously. No. <laughs> well, I mean, you have to ask the question, and I think. I mean, this is a this isn't even just controversial for Ireland. This is the world over the idea of how long oral tradition mm -hmm. might last, and I think it's such a hard question, right? Because. 
um, because once you go beyond the written record, you really don't know. Um, like, uh, I, I think there's been some really interesting studies uh, from Australia where different Aboriginal groups have memories of uh, uh, mountains erupting. That's fascinating. Uh, they're dormant volcanoes that haven't gone off in, in yeah. thousands of years. And um, I think it all then ties up with linguistics, uh, which is another mm, <laughs> mm. area that, that seemed like a lot of debate, uh, a lot of paradigms overturned in the past five, six years. Um, I mean, since we've established this massive step migration into mm. Northern Europe and, and Western Europe, the late Neolithic and Bronze Age, it's sort of now uh, pretty much accepted that this is when the major branches of Indo-European were introduced mm -hmm. to Europe and into Western Europe. So we could very reasonably say that the early Irish, the early Bronze Age population in Ireland was speaking some form of Indo-European. Mm. When some form of Celtic was introduced, mm. that's a question. Um, but it's likely that any later branches of the European introduced to Ireland it would have been related to the language being spoken there since the early Bronze Age. Um, so then it's the question of, okay, this Neolithic to early Bronze Age transition, how much opportunity was there for exchange of culture, exchange of folklore, um, how might the early Bronze Age population have made sense of these massive uh, monumental landscapes like Bruna Boinia? How much would they have known? How much would they have made up themselves? And then, and then you have to survive like two to three millennia. Then, um, but, but they did make they did make use of these places. They did bury their dead there. They did. Um, they didn't. Yes. The, there's a sort of continuity. It's interesting in like places like Karakil, where their pots are in there. They visited. They seem to treat with great respect. So, and then you think about America, where Native American place names still uh, are applied. No, no, like I mean, it, it's completely like it's not outside the realms of possibility uh, in any in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think. Um, when we talk about the Neolithic to Bronze Age transition, it, it's quite different from the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition. Like the Neolithic population of Ireland were an established complex society with large population numbers. We don't know if there was a crash at the end of the Neolithic. Um, but when the early Bronze Age population came in, I, well, this is future work from our lab that that's being done. Um, but um uh, I think there's definitely the potential for admi for genetic admixture between the two populations. Uh, definitely, you can see in the material culture interaction um, how that consolidated over time. That that's that's to that's work to be done in the yeah. future. Um, but from I think the important thing is from the early Bronze Age on, we have very strong genetic continuity in. Ireland, mm. and that's something that's sort of typical of uh, uh, islands or peripheral parts of, of uh, continents that you tend to see longer-term genetic continuity in these places um, compared to crossroads in places like Central Asia, where obviously you have so much movement back and forth. So th there definitely was, um, and always is, a, a migration going on into Ireland after the early Bronze Age, but not enough um, to erase that very strong signature of continuity. Um, yeah, so I, I was going to say, you know, it just strikes me that the things that, that your paper is so, it's a, we, it's a radical paper. It's a, it's a paper that's extremely challenging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it demands that, that people, we can never look again the same as lots of these things that we've looked at for 300 years, or for 3,000 years for that matter. Um, yeah. For example, uh, you look at, Car at the Caramore monuments or Caracil now, they're about particular people more than what they were ever before. It is, yeah, I think um, ancient DNA is giving us a new lens to look at past people in Ireland uh, across the world and that can add a new human side to things as well. Mm. Um, 
especially in terms of kinship and stuff, I, I find that all fascinating, even within a particular site, suddenly being able to explore family relations between people. It, it really brings them to life. There was an amazing, sorry, I'm going on a tangent. There was an amazing study on a late Neolithic per, uh, group burial in Poland, mm. uh, where they untangled all of this, uh, all of these family relations, and they had a man and woman uh, uh, buried quite close together who didn't have any relationship at all and then you can actually extrapolate it about non-genetic forms of kinship from that yes, which is just, very good. it's great but like the, yeah that, that's an amazing side to this um, uh, to be able to look at uh, yeah sorry go on well I'm going to sort of, I'm going to thanks a million Larry it's going to be absolutely fantastic to speak with you I, I, I'm going to sort of wind up I, I, fairly soon I was going to say two things one is that Obviously, what it's done is it's rendered the, the, our picture of the Irish Neolithic, the level of complexity in that society has just gone off the radar that would, uh, compared to how we viewed it before. It, it, yeah, I mean, I think definitely and, and, uh, there's just so much more interpretation now to be done. This has laid another body of evidence in, in front of experts, and this is going to be needed to be integrated in now to our interpretations of these these monuments. Um, I think you're right. This is the idea of um, these societies, how complex they were, was already being challenged with um, uh, with um, the migration, right? That sure. this is actually a very rapid mass migration that would have required, you know, extremely advanced seafaring technology. Um, Oh, which again, and, and then there's been recent work on radiocarbon dates um, and the spread of passage tombs around the Atlantic seaboard and how fast that happened. And that's mm. looking like a lot faster than potentially originally thought. So this is just one, one strand of that. And um, obviously the Irish Neolithic is the Irish Neolithic, um, how far we can extrapolate to um, other Atlantic regions um, that might share similar material cultures, that remains to be seen as oh, well. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're really like just scratching the surface. With this I, I saw you tweeting at some point that we're at the tip of the iceberg here, you know. I mean, somebody said, let's see the rest of the iceberg, we can't wait. Yeah, um, I, think, I think, and then we have to accept as well that there is some stuff that ancient DNA just won't be able to address and I think like a really good example of that is the amount of cremated bone in passage mm, to we'll side, never yeah. be able to get ancient DNA. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and, and did, if you had a dream um, sort of uh, further research pattern where would you be would you what would your question be in terms of of, of supporting or clarifying the outcome uh, that you your interpretation or, yeah is there another step now of of interpretation Ireland. Say again. The Neolithic Ireland. Yes. Specifically, what I, I think, and this feeds into Marion Dowd's work, actually, I think we need to sample more from non megalithic sites. Yes. I mean, the other thing that we should do and we will do is, is look at more passage tomb sites. We want to see if we can find more patterns of kinship. Um, we want to see how common um, this degree of inbreeding was. Um, so that needs to be done. but when we look at past burials, I think there is a tendency to sample more elite burials, not just in the Neolithic, uh, but a lot of uh, periods like the Bell Beaker period as well, because these uh, these graves are more prominent. Um, so there's a research bias there. Um, I think it would be great to sample more of the general Neolithic population of Ireland. I don't know where they are. I'm hoping they're in case. But... Um, yeah, because you always have to question that. And it's the same, so say we have that individual in Park Nabinia Court tomb with uh, a recent Irish hunter-gatherer in his, in his family tree. Um, there's that big question mark of how long did Irish hunter-gatherer populations persist? There's so few uh, Irish hunter-gatherer burials from the entire Mesolithic. Um, there was very potentially... Uh, Irish intergather populations who were fully that Irish intergather ancestry uh, surviving on the island through the Neolithic. We don't know. Mm. We don't know how old they were. We don't know how separate the two groups were. Um, so, like, I mean, 
archaeologists know this already, like we are limited um, by the record. But, but archaeologists up to now debated for years and years about whether or not Irish hunter-gatherers um, were uh, separate, uh, were, or the, were there links to, uh, to, to Europe and to the UK, and you seem to have uh, really finished that debate. With, with this new paper. Well, from our late Mesolithic genomes, we are dealing with an isolated population, and a population that had limited, if any, contact with Britain and with the continent. And then with our very earliest Neolithic population, that flips. What we have is a population that is very much in contact with Britain and the continent. Um, huge migration in, very, very likely, if you have the seafaring technology to stage such a, a quick and rapid movement and you, you will have the technology to continue contact. And you see that again from the material culture, uh, from jadeite axes ending up in mm. the west of Mayo, like you, you know that from the Neolithic onwards, Ireland has been pulled into the continental sphere and it never leaves us. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, Lara, um, it, thanks so much for your time uh, and your <laughs> insights. Um, <laughs> congratulations again on the paper, it's just, just wonderful. Um, I'm so <laughs> It's 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 it's, it's uh, astonishing, and it's going to take a huge amount of of digesting and the processing. And I'm sure, as you say, though, as this iceberg emerges further, we're go you're going to have even more jaw-dropping insights for us. Um, I just wanted to wish you the absolute best of luck with, with the rest of us. Go ahead, sorry. Um, yeah, hopefully, and uh, like I, I suppose it's going to expand as well. Like. Um... I, this is starting to become too much probably for one particular research group. So like uh, hopefully ancient DNA can be something, you know, um, we see lots of people working on uh, mm -hmm. within Ireland and Britain. Mm -hmm. well, and well, have a, sorry, just, I'm now going around. Like, I mean, there's great groups starting up uh, in the UK as well. So there's gonna be, and I mean, Ireland is one part of the European story um, and we can contribute a lot to it. Um, but other regional groups in different areas, we need their work to interpret ours as well. We need them to catch up. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Lara, thanks a million uh, again. And, and we're so, I'm so pleased to, to have spoken to you and you to come on uh, living on a, in a Leitrim landscape. Um, I'm going thanks. to say goodbye at this point. Okay. Uh, thanks a million. <laughs> um, and wave goodbye and uh, see you again take care thank you bye bye <laughs> thank you